this is a really great conversation because we can also talk about um, this really exciting frontier for Web3, which is Web3 and blockchain gaming, um, which I think is going to be a huge driver for the next cycle when it comes to mainstream adoption, attention, market volume, all of the good things. So why don't we start off, just give us a little bit of the background story, like because you have a lot of experience coming from the traditional gaming industry, bringing it to Web3. Absolutely. So um, welcome, everybody. So we're here to launch a, to uh, show our metaverse that we're building. And we're on the mission to create uh, this really great, amazing metaverse in this city set of Miami. Um, I was, uh, I met the guys last year and uh, really fell in love with the project. And um, the guys who are putting together are doing it for the right reasons. They're building something that I think everybody wants to see, which is a metaverse. We've, we've heard about it a long time and, and we've seen it in movies, films, books and we're actually on the mission to create that, which is fantastic. And as somebody who's been in gaming for my whole professional career, and even before as a player, uh, I kind of see this as the evolution of games. So when we thought, think about games on your console, or on your phone, or you think about them on your PC, um, every year they get bigger, they get more beautiful, uh, more people play, the gaming market is bigger than it's ever been, $185 billion. But still, they're creating this thing where, you know, it, it, it's bigger every year. So I remember in my start of my career, I don't know if you guys ever played a game called Tony Hawk, but I was a QA tester on that oh, yeah. game, which was wonderful. And then after that, I got a really amazing opportunity to work on some games that you might also have heard of. I was a producer on uh, a couple World of Warcrafts, uh, Diablo 3, StarCraft 2. I was able to then go, I uh, worked at a company at Rockstar. They, they dropped a little bit of a trailer a couple days ago. I don't know if anyone heard about it. Uh, but I was able to work on Grand Theft Auto V and Grand Theft Auto Online. I've also worked on a project uh, that's really big in, the, um, you know, in terms of innovation and getting bigger called Star Citizen, in terms of going straight through Kickstarter and bringing, it to, bringing the game to the fans. And so every step of my career has been about online games and kind of pushing them forward from an MMO to this Kickstarter, to something bigger and something bigger. And so it's a dream to work on a metaverse. So when I was able to meet with Frank and Neil and they explained to me what they were trying to do, I realized that in order to build the metaverse, we've got to take the best stuff from game development and AAA, what we've learned over this time, and bring it to the expertise in the Web3 community. And if we can bring the best of both of these worlds, that's what it's going to take to build the metaverse. And how could anyone pass up that opportunity, you know? I love that, I love that. And we're gonna dive into the metaverse. There's a lot to talk about there. But before we do, that's a really significant jump to make in, in a career, right? I'm it sure is. that some of, your, some of your colleagues in the traditional <laughs> gaming industry may have been a little wary, be like, what, what, are, what are you doing over here in, the, sure. in, uh, in Web3? So tell us a little bit about, A, what drew you to the Wilder team? And B, like what, what that was kind of like to make that kind of jump and that leap of faith from one industry to the next, like kind of on that new frontier. Absolutely. So, you know, there's this incredible journey and it can be your dream to make a metaverse or it can be your dream to make an amazing game. But if you don't have the right people with you, it's never going to happen. So when I had the opportunity to meet with them and understood why they were involved in it, and it wasn't a financial decision, it wasn't... Um, you know, the trendy thing decision. It wasn't something they just got into because everyone was talking about it. It's because they've been working on it for years and they've been doing it for the right reasons and they had a vision for why metaverse and specifically why simulations are so important and what they can do and let us learn about ourselves, learn about the world and come up with something that, you know, uh, helps us innovate on society as a whole. You know, these concepts, concepts of decentralization and ownership and like your digital, like who you are and, and, and what we can do here. That's why they were in it. And that's their mission. And it kind of was like, okay, so you guys are like doing this for like a really great reason. You're doing this really amazing thing. And then it was, then it was like, oh, and by the way, we have an amazing team. We have a team of people with expertises in all these different domains. And it felt possible. It felt like, okay, it's gonna be a lot of work. It's gonna be years to do, but if we can, again, I, I can bring a little bit with games. I can say, I know how we make something player focused. I know how we make really amazing experiences. I know how to take a group of really smart people and like let them do what they do best. And, and the, in the other side of the company, the Web3 does what they do best. And what you get is what we had today, Midnight in Miami, our first playable 
And, um, you know, if you guys haven't played it, please go do it. It's a tremendous amount of fun. It's really fun. I was just <laughs> doing it before this. I'm, like, all amped up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so that's what it is. It's a bunch of great people. It's a great mission, and we're having a whole lot of fun. Hell yeah. And you know who else had a whole lot of fun was every single person at the VIP opening party <laughs> last night because that line was out the door. That was amazing. Awesome. That was awesome to see. Like I, I kept trying to go back there and play it and it was just like there was never a free spot, you know? Yeah. Um, so let's let's get into the vision for the metaverse. Like tell us, tell us like the vision for the metaverse um, with Wilder World and then how like uh, Midnight in Miami, like what role that plays. In, in the storytelling, in the narrative, and in, in introducing this experience to the masses. Absolutely. So Wire of the World is uh, it's a metaverse, and it's a 5G metaverse. We, uh, it's a decentralized, photorealistic metaverse uh, built on the blockchain. And it's um, essentially um, inside of this Wilder World metaverse, we have our first city, and that's called Wyami which is kind of fun to be here, right? So it's Miami, and Miami is uh, a simulation of Miami. It's not Miami, but it's, uh, you know, you can definitely tell the streets there. You drive down Ocean Drive, like there's some things there. But um, it's a simulation, uh, the city of Miami, and in the city, um, there is essentially a group called the Wilders. And the Wilders, they race, they're in the city, um, they're our citizens, they're in our Discord, and they're in the simulation. It's, it's literally, you know, IRL meets, meets the metaverse, but everyone here can be a wilder, and you come, into the, you come into the city, and we're there with a new way of how we want to operate the simulation, right? So it's decentralized, it looks beautiful, um, all the things in the game, uh, just from a mechanical point of view, your car is an NFT, your avatar, your, the, the clothing that you have, um, your apartment. Um, there's a whole lot of different NFTs that we have, and they're basically, they, they make up all the nouns, of, if you can think about it that way, all the nouns of the city. And uh, we're, we're kind of at the point now where we're building it, and uh, we, we wanted to start on, on how we make it really, really fun. This is where we come back to the game side, right? So when you're coming up with a game, the whole point is to find the fun. You want to find something that people really, really want to play. Um, it's like any other product, right? So find the fun. And for us, it was going to be, we're building this city within Wilder World called Wyoming. It's the size of a North American city. So that means it's car-based, right? Like, just physically, it's a car gets you around. So what is more fun than, like, street racing with driving around? So let's make traversal fun. So you can explore, explore in the car, drive around, and, and just kind of help see this whole big city while we build it out. So for us, it was, okay, boom, let's do this. Let's make uh, 1v1 racing. Let's get the racing sims to make it as immersive as possible. And let's have this really fun three or four minute experience. And so once we knew that, we could focus on making that really fun and watch the team play it. And as the team played it more and more and more and had more ideas, it, it improved from August to September to October to November to now. It's literally been better every month because we've got a really tight, focused vision on what we want this experience in Midnight Miami to be. Then, once we've got that, next is gonna be building out the city, right? Once the city's been built out, that's gonna be the vision for Miami. Once Miami's done, we can do another city. You know, that's where Wild the World comes in. This is a simulation because we wanna see how digital societies can interact together and how they can be formed. I love that. And you know, like, I, I imagine, no, I am not a game developer, but I can imagine that, like, the process of, of building this was probably really eye-opening and illustrative and probably, like, opened your eyes to, like, certain, like, challenges and also new opportunities in, like, in the trajectory of building out this metaverse. Can you speak to that a bit? Like, that process of, like, developing uh, Midnight in Miami and how that kind of, like, informed the greater vision? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So game development, like some of the principles have always kind of been constant, right? So you want to understand uh, what experience you're trying to give. Um, and so if we're trying to have an experience of exploring the metaverse, we want to define that up front and know that's exploration. That's where the traversal and moving around, you explore, you got to move. Uh, and then what you want to do is say every element to this game needs to play to that core player fantasy of moving and exploring a metaverse. So from the art style, to the gameplay, to the sound, to the lore, to everything wants to reinforce that. So that hasn't changed. Now what has changed? 
we have a giant new toolbox available to us as, a, as game developers. So um, looking at things such as the blockchain allows us to create absolutely unique assets. That's really exciting in a game if we use it right. That allows for player ownership. We also have technologies that have come out, whether it's AI or whether it's procedural technologies, where we're able to build much more quickly and we're able to generate crazy things in a, sh a fraction of the time. And so this is another new tool we have in our toolbox, right? So there's a bunch of things going on there with the chain, uh, with our token. Well, that makes a lot of sense. That's a new tool that we can use to provide fuel for the car and other things that we can do. So um, essentially, merging gaming and Web3 has given us a lot more tools to make these grand, huge online games or these metaverses than we had before. And the trick is knowing how to bring them together. Yeah, that's easier said than done, right? It's very easier said than done. Way <laughs> easier said than done. So what are, what are some of the lessons learned or insights uh, that you've kind of gleaned from the process of bringing the best of you know, traditional gaming and game development and then like the unique elements that exist for Web3 and, and the blockchain element? Yeah, so we're still figuring it out. I think that's the first thing to say is that this is not a done process. This is not a, 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 a something we've got. But we definitely have ideas um, uh, of things that are interesting, such as um, something that's obviously really cool from a game, a game standpoint is car ownership. And so as we're designing our cars and how we want them to work, um, something that the blockchain makes really easy and that we're going for is um, not really easy. I shouldn't say that. There's <laughs> guys in the room who are working on this. Um, but how you upgrade your car, right? The parts of your car. So as you want to upgrade something, you can kind of put these things together. So you've got maybe the car as a whole, and then you want to put new rims on the car. You want to put a new spoiler on the car. And these are kind of things that now Web3 makes possible, but also comes with all kinds of challenges. Another, another idea of that is the car will have gas. So as you travel around the world, you're going to use gas in the car. So that's something that we know we want to do as we're a realistic metaverse. So how do we do that? You know what I mean? So this is the challenge where from a gaming standpoint, that like, oh, this would be really cool to do, and it seems like it's a good use of, 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 like a, of the token and how, how that would work. And then it's kind of, there's some economic things that we've got to figure out there. And you know, we'll figure them out and we'll, and, and we'll get there, but these are brand new problems we're solving. This is not a problem that we would have in World of Warcraft or Grand Theft Auto because literally it's a you know it's a in-game transaction on you know that that you can make infinite amount of parts for your car. Gas is free, and these type of things have infinite amount of parts. Gas is free. You know, a Web two kind of game. The publisher owns everything. Um, this is it's easy for the player, but then the player really kind of isn't an owner of this metaverse. So it's not really a metaverse. It's just a big game. Yeah, no, that's 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 a really interesting element. Is like thinking about some of these. Like we were talking about earlier, it's like these in-game economies. Those aren't yeah. easy to get right, yeah. right? Like those are elements that, like you know, um, you know, d don't necessarily play the same role in traditional gaming, um, but uh, become quite important when you have these, like you know, more open ecosystems or more, you know, like where things can be traded on open markets and the like. Absolutely, and and. Another interesting thing about this that maybe people don't see is as you're designing these cars, so let's take the cars for example, it's something that everybody can kind of understand is, you know, we've got cars for sale now and cars available for people to have. Um, and as we build the game out, the cars will come in, which is great. Um, well, there's kind of two customers for a car because when we bring these worlds together, now we're bringing markets together, right? So you've got people who hold our NFT cars, right? And these are, these are we love them, they're wilders, like, like like, let's go, we love you. Um, and they have these beautiful cars that are gonna drive so great in the game, as you guys can see, and have real value. They're absolutely valuable, and they're gonna really stick out in this world. And then, as we wanna grow wilder world, we're gonna have to bring in the AAA gamer. Like, we're gonna have to go to the game conferences, we're gonna have to talk to the gamers, the people that, that we know, who are accustomed to spending $70 on a game, and they expect to have a car available to them. And so it's like, well, we need to make sure they have that experience, right? It, it can't be like, oh, I'm sorry, 12-year-old kid who really wants to play my game. Like, you have to spend X amount of money to play. It's like I would have hated that as a kid. So we have to have, like, multiple ways to entry as, as we bring these together. And that's, to go back to your question about the economy, that's what makes it challenging and, like, exciting at the same time is, is how, how do we build this metaverse together and, um, you know, allow for the, the, you know, the investor type 
and then also allow for the, the kid who just wants to play. But if you're an investor, you want to be invested in a metaverse where millions of kids are playing. Like that's obvious, or millions of people are playing. That's obviously going to help you in the long run, right? Yeah, that's a that's actually a really interesting element. You know, one of the things like even when we announced um, you know Gate, Gateway Miami and Wilder World's involvement, there was a lot of excitement. You could see like on social the energy from the Wilder World community, right? That's a real thing. Yeah. Like you're and that, and that's a bit of a different energy than just a player base, right? Mm -hmm. Because like we said, one of the big things that's exciting and and empowering about Web three is that it allows people to actually share in that value that they create. It's the difference between being a fan and like a shareholder, right? It's the yes. difference. It, people have a sense of ownership, and that's that's a big driver for this community for us. What is it like building for that base? Because it's very different than just like oh, I like you said like. I bought, you know, I bought a game and now I play. Right? Yeah, exactly. So, so for me, it's um, exciting and scary um, because I'm still so new about this, right? So my gaming background, um, I want to make sure that, like, I see the excitement on the face. We've got, we've got Wilders here. I see their excitement. I feel it. I love it. Um, and w I want to make sure they have such a great experience and that by bringing in, and we have a lot of people on the team, by the way. It's not. It's certainly not just me. The, uh, everybody on our team bringing in like this game development and this and, like making sure that we play really well as a game. We don't want to hurt where they came in. Like they joined the project. We don't want to hurt that in any way. So uh, it's really exciting to see it. It's also like something. It's not scary, but it's like we have to make sure we take that seriously. Where um, in bringing two things together, a good and a good, that we don't come up with some kind of weird fruit salad that doesn't work. <laughs> if you will. Yeah. So um, I think we'll be able to do it um, like anything else. Um, fortunately, we're really open. And, you know, uh, our founders, Frank and Neo, are like doing it for the right reasons. And we're open. We're in, with the community. So we'll mess up and they'll tell us and, and, and we'll fix it. So uh, I think we'll get there. So There it is. You know, it, it's interesting, too. We talked about like the traditional, um, like the, the AAA games, right? Yeah. AAA games are not built overnight. Right, they take a lot of time, right? Uh, yes. And um, I, I'm curious, you know, like what what is you know, what is the state of like the intersection of the AAA game world and like blockchain gaming? Like, what are you seeing there? It, you know, is there an understanding? Is there a lack of trust? Is there a bit of both? Like, are like what's being built? What's not being built? I'm I'm curious, like, what's the state of the union? Yeah. So um, there's a lot changing in gaming right now. Um, obviously, as it's grown. Um, Mobile is taking over gaming to a large degree. So that's the number one thing to, to understand is how it's growing. So gaming is now so huge that there's room for everybody. Um, and it's been exponential. I think when I got into the industry in the mid 2000s, gaming was like a 20 or $30 billion industry. It's about a $185 billion industry. So you gotta understand that growth has been so huge in gaming. And you kind of realize that every, every child being born right now is a gamer. Like, Man, like, 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 doesn't matter who they are, what country they're from, every single child being born will play games. So we kind of have 100% of the market, like, like 100, whatever, you know, whatever you look at there. So what does that mean? There's, rooms for every, there's room for everyone in games. Um, what I see in AAA is that um, it, it costs so much to make a AAA game now, and the AAA games are starting to see this budget in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, I think that will start to come down with a lot of this AI technology we have, this AI content creation. Uh, this generation of games that you're playing now, um, including like GTA 6 or, or, or Starfield or Baldur's Gate, uh, some of these really big games this year, they're kind of, in my opinion, um, they're amazing games. Uh, well, we haven't played all of them, but um, they're kind of built pre-AI content. So they're very expensive budget games. So I think you're gonna see two things. I think you're gonna see the AI and the generation bring budgets down for some games, and some games will hold budgets at the same level and then bring up the amount of content they can create. But essentially, um, it's unsustainable to continue to spend this much money uh, on games, and it causes some big publishers to really like, have to do so much capital up front in order to make it back, it's really big risks. So for AAA, they're gonna be strong. There's, it's gonna be fine. AI is gonna bring some of their budgets down and some of them are gonna be even more premium. So when we look at Web3 gaming, it's its infancy. Um, and I think it's got, it's, it's got a lot going for it, but one of the things that I do see and one of the things that, that was important to me, you asked earlier about when I joined was, you've gotta make sure that you understand gaming and, it's, and, and certainly it starts with being a player. 
and that's really important. But you've got to like learn from the 20 or 30 years of knowledge that we've accumulated in game creation about how to design a game that is first and foremost about the gameplay. The gameplay is so important. And if you don't get that right, nothing else matters. It's like a great restaurant with terrible food. No one, it doesn't, nobody would go there. So I think if, if you're, we are making a Web3 game, but for all the other on the market, then there are good ones out there. Like it's all about the gameplay. And if you get that right, it solves so many problems and you can figure out a lot of the other things as you go. But one thing I will say is that in general, AAA has figured out the gameplay. Maybe it's too conservative, but they know what they're doing and they're gonna try to use, use the Web3 technologies to make their games more effectively. The Web3 side needs to learn from game design and say, okay, what are some of these things that are being done? Like, if you're making a game, go pick up Baldur's Gate 3 and see what they're doing. Even though it's a Web2 game, it's, it doesn't really matter, it's a game and they've made playing so fun. Like, learn from that. Take what you know in Web3 and say, okay, this is how we can make this better. This is how we can make this better. And, uh, you know, it's, so it's kind of like that old race between like, does Netflix become HBO before HBO becomes Netflix? You've got that a little bit going on too, I think. That makes a lot of sense. And you know, I, I think you touched on something really interesting too, and you talked about, um, you know, the traditional gamers, right? Yeah. The people who are used to like the AAA games, all that. The, there's, there's a lot of reluctance and, and even it's... outright resistance to NFTs, to Web3, to blockchain gaming. To, uh, from from that traditional gamer uh, um, demographic, and I'm curious, like, where do you think that stems from? Why do you think that exists? And what can we do? And how are you thinking about it from the wilder world perspective to overcome that and bring you know these traditional gamers into what I think many of us can agree here. You know, many of us think is the future of yeah. the space. Yeah, hey, absolutely. So I mean, I think I think it's new, and people are afraid of what's new, but I don't think it's just that. Like, it's the easiest thing is just to say, sorry, it's easy to say, oh, it's an early adopter thing, and eventually it'll be, you know, figured out over time. I don't think that's necessarily the case. Um, not all gamers are the same, not all players are the same. So, if you think all gamers would like all games, so uh, someone who plays a traditional player of games in that industry would like your Web3 game because it is a game and that's all that you need to do, um, well then it doesn't really work that way because you're building the, you could be building the game for the wrong reasons and you could be um, saying, well, it's got NFTs and that's enough, right? So just putting NFTs in something is enough. That's not why players play, right? So players play to have fun. First and foremost, play is a, is a, is a very pure thing that people do. Um, the kid playing Lego on the, on the floor is not playing for any benefit other than having fun. People playing in the park might be playing for money, but generally speaking, people play chess for fun. It's not because they're trying to become a professional, right? Play is a pure thing that is done just for fun. And whenever NF they hear NFTs, they think, are you, are, are you threatening my fun space? Like, what are you bringing that's gonna make this more fun? Are you trying to monetize my fun? And it doesn't, it's not what they're looking for. It's, it's, it's not, you're not solving a problem for them. You know, uh, it's the same kind of thing of why doesn't, why don't most players like slot machines? Well, I mean, some do, of course, but well, slot machines are kind of a game, right? Well, it's not the same thing. You know what I mean? That's done to gamble. That's not my play space that's fun, that's gambling. So NFTs, if, there's, if they're made as investments for people who are looking to, you know, hold these and have the digital value and just say, let's just make this work, you're not bringing anything to the player that the player wants. Now, on the flip side, there is a way to do it, and that's kind of, I think, the, the bet of Wilder World is that there is a way to do it correctly, and the bet of all Web3 games is that if you think about it from the core player experience that we showed up here and that we have uh, available here, it is um, you're racing through the city and you're competing with your friends and you're able to upgrade this car and customize it, and it's this wonderful you know, race through Miami that could be your car. You know what I mean? You could be the one to fix it. You could be the one to upgrade it. You could be the one to race for slips, for example, right? And if we think about it from that point of view, um, it, there's a purity to it of like, that's the reason for it to exist. And, there's a, and, and so now you can become a creator. You can really build this. And the value is nice, but it goes back to that thing some people will play Wilder World and they don't care about the money. It's just because it's fun. And that's what we have to keep in mind. 
So there's that going on. And so when we're talking about why NFTs scare people, that was, I think, your question. Why, when Ubisoft announced their NFTs, they had to pull it back or it, was, it didn't go over well. Gamers were scared. You're trying to come into their play space and they get very defensive about that. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense because at, at the same time too, um, a lot of these like traditional game companies, it's actually in their financial interest not to be an open, like, you know, to have their walled gardens, right? You know, and, 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 and to that. And so I'm curious, like, what do you think will uh, change that? What do you think will kind of change that calculus and, and become and kind of bring this to a point where like, you know, it, it's unavoidable? So I think, I think it's gonna be examples of great games is really what it's gonna be, um, you know, because people, it's gonna have to be a game that's so good that people don't care about the Web3 nature. They care, about this is such an amazing experience and it happens to have it. Um, you know, it's kind of one of these things where I don't really care about the technology, I care about what it does. Why is robots so successful? It's amazing. You don't really care about the technology going by, on behind it. It's just so much fun. <laughs> Same thing with Fortnite, right? Overall, I think we'll have a successful game, and then we have multiple games working together, building an industry where it's not just one game that you play. There's a series of Web3 games all kind of working together to support each other and create an industry where potentially assets can be shared between, the, between them and people can start to really analyze, okay, here's what works in Web3 games, what doesn't. And then people will start to really kind of like this new genre of Web3 game. They'll start to say, hey, there's this game coming out from this Web3 game maker, I'm really excited about it, are you? You know, the wilder people are there on the Star Atlas forums being like, hey, there's this thing going on, there's this thing going on. And then we start to build that ecosystem and we start to build this kind of this, this, these young gamers coming in will really start to understand um, the power that Web3 gaming can be. But in order to make a movement, it can't be one person. One person walking in a direction is not a movement. It's a group of people going there. So hopefully at Wilder World, we can be really successful with what we're doing, build this amazing metaverse, really make the Wilders happy, um, and then we can work with other games that are successful as well, and then, uh, and then I think we start to get that leverage. I don't think it'll necessarily be Electronic Arts, Ubisoft doing it, if that makes sense. Makes total sense. So let's see, like, so if you haven't already, obviously go check out the, the Wilder World Racing Experience. It's really, really cool. And it gives me, like, it gives you kind of like a window into that world. But I feel like it's also just the beginning, right? Like, this is like, like, this is gonna tie into so many more things and different experiences. And I'd love to hear kind of like, like, what, what does that future look like? What, is that, what does that vision look like? I know we touched on it in the beginning, but like, you know, it's like, there's this racing element, we got Miami, there may be other cities, there may be other types of experiences too. Like, t take us through that a bit. For sure, so when you guys go up there and play, what you're gonna see is, it takes about three or four minutes to race around, and it's probably, I don't know, it's a four or five kilometer track, right? Through the city, and it's kind of in South Beach, it's fun, you'll see some of the city names. Um, for us, it's gonna be about really just making that little, that little area uh, a sandbox and making it wider and starting to build out the city in terms of literally just size and making, you know, increasing the amount of area that you can go in, amount of gameplay that you can do in there and, the, and, and, and basically increasing the size over the city of, of Miami till we're at our, full, our fully developed state. Uh, at the same time, we wanna layer depth in. So we have a lot of our NFTs and we have a lot of our gameplay that we want to add. So over time into Wilder World, we want to be adding more and more of that into there as we go and uh, providing more depth to the gameplay. Um, I think what you'll see as a, from an outside standpoint, if you're a Wilder, is hopefully next year is where we want to get to, you know, a version of a playable game that gets out there, um, you know, and we'll be able to announce and have something out there. Uh, uh, you know, we're an Unreal project, so, you know, Epic, uh, you know, is really great for us to work with. So it's gonna be about us becoming a playable product that's out there, um, increasing the size of what you can play, and then adding more and more gameplay depth. Um, and then, you know, it can go on for years, um, but obviously with, with, with a, a metaverse that is photorealistic, it looks beautiful, uh, with something that's decentralized and really has player empowerment, we would love to get to the place, you know, crazy ideas where people can start their own things. And, and it's really, you know, there's ideas about players starting their own planets and cities and different kinds of things like this. 
It's really not about us controlling everything. It's about us setting up a metaverse where, where we can have fun with these simulations and we can, and we can work on it. So the future is wide open and, and there's a lot of things to do. Um, building a metaverse is like building the universe. Yeah, you like, know? <laughs> and, that's a great and, way of putting it. And uh, I think in the, in the Old Testament, God did it in seven days, but we're gonna take a little bit longer than that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well that's very understandable. And one of the things that, that like, you just mentioned that actually kind of made me think is like, when, for example, a normal game ships, right? That game kind of exists in that form, right? Like obviously you might have like an expansion pack, things like that, you can always run that, but like, a metaverse is different because a metaverse is fluid, right? A metaverse can continually be updated. In many cases, a metaverse can actually be built by some of the players. Like, the players can actually have a role in helping build that too, right? And so, like, what, what kind of, like, unique challenges and opportunities does that face versus, like, normal games? Well, I mean, uh, development? yeah, a lot. Basically. I mean, a ton, right? Um, I figured, I figured. I, I, think, I think, and I think there's examples of it. We don't have to necessarily, like, define the future and figure out what it could do. There's examples in the modding community. If you look at uh, any, any gamers here, uh, you look at a game like Skyrim, uh, which is a huge game by Bethesda, or the Fallout uh, series. Uh, and there's a lot of these where um, once a game kind of has gone through its life cycle, uh, the three or four years where it's actively kind of developed, um, the fans start coding it themselves. And the fans start downloading SDKs, and the fans start doing asset swaps, and they do all these different kinds of things, and then the game really becomes the, 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 you know, the people who still play it really own the game itself at a certain point. And so what it shows is if you make something that resonates with people as a company, even if you like drop it and say we're kind of done, they'll keep it going. And that just shows how passionate people can be about these. So when we talk about like this metaverse or this type of approach, um, we want to be, that's one of the reasons why player ownership is so important is that we can kind of build, build that in from the start of, you know, uh, mod, modding welcome, you know what I mean, to, to, to a certain degree. Now, when we're talking about online racing and we're talking about com competition, you know, cheating is obviously out there, so we're going to have to do a lot around that, right? That's a, a problem we'll have to address. But in terms of content creation, I mean, that's what the metaverse is all about. Let's dive into that, actually. Like, cheating, like, what, what, what role does that play? Like, how do you, how do you prevent that in a in a like uh, you know a, a Web three game because that can actually have financial implications, right? Absolutely, and I mean, it's a huge part. It's a huge part in tech. Uh, you can't prevent it. Like you know what I mean? Like you you invent a big you exploit essentially, right? An exploit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You make you make a better law. You make a better safe. They make a better safe cracker, right? So, a couple of things that you're gonna do is architecturally, right? Is that you're you know. All these games are client server games. So, you know, you've got all your players or clients and you've got the server. And we do some simple things such as the server is the authority. So the server decides what happens everywhere. So um, the, the client can't change another client's behavior without, the, you know, going to the server. And there's a, a whole lot of technical things that go on there. And we've got some people here who are really good at that stuff and can tell you a lot more about that than I can. But there's some architecture we've learned in games. And I think um, there's also some cheat detection that we've learned in games. And, there's some certain things that we can do. Um, if you go and you use iRacing, there's programs you have to install on your PC. If you're gonna be playing competitively, that monitor, right? If you're playing a lot of you know, other MMOs, they will literally run things on your computer to check what other applications are open to know that you're not cheating. So these are basically things that the gaming industry has had to do over the past 15 years to try to cut down on cheating. And if you're coming into Web3, like, learn about that stuff. I'm not saying do it, but like, don't, like it, it is a problem that has a lot of effort already behind it. And so, you know, basically embrace the gaming industry and say, okay, these companies building this stuff, like you can work with them too, and I'm sure they'd love to work with you. I love that, I love that. It makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, it, it, it's interesting too, because when you think about like building out a world, right? You're, 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 there's always, there's an opportunity cost, right, to, every, to everything you do in a, from a gaming perspective. You're playing one game right now, you're not playing another game, right? And so, obviously, like, I think there's a lot of space to go around, right? Like you said, everyone's a gamer, all these young generations and the like. But how do you think about, like, the unique value proposition of, for example, like, Wilder Worlds, Wilder Worlds metaverse versus, like, you know, other metaverses that are being built. Also, like, you know, some of the existing 
big like for, like the fort like the, the 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 Robloxes and the Fortnites and the like like how do you think about like really staking out a unique like value proposition? Well, I think that's really really difficult, right? So the big competition is for player time. Like we're all aware of this, right? So the player time is on their phone while they're um, going to work, maybe on the subway, or it, they're competing for the player time, you know, after dinner, before bed, right? And at that point, you're competing with. Is there a game on? Is there a show on? So we're all competing over time at this point because everyone's got great content. So this is something that definitely exists in games and it's why you have to stand out and that's why quality matters so much because something that's not fun, that's not built around that player experience we talked about, that's really player focused. Um, if it's just okay, there's no room for okay. There's too much great out there. But this is honestly, I think where Web3 can really or people who are coming with that, you've, there's a whole lot of those unique tools that we talked about, that toolbox of different things that we now have. There's a whole bunch of tools in there that people haven't seen before. So it gives you the ability to make something unique and break through a market where you're not gonna have you know, the story to go up against some of these uh, more established creators. You're not gonna have the creativity to you know, go up against the incredible indie gaming scene and the incredible indie game developers. So understand what your unique strengths are. And, and using those, you can compete for time. Now there's certain, there's other things we can go in here too, but there are concepts of people having their everyday game that they play every day, like a World of Warcraft or a Fortnite. They're gonna play that game no matter what, and they'll take breaks to play games that come out over time, right? So this depends on the Web3 game you're making. If you're making kind of a persistent or a metaverse or something that's kind of a, a game as a service, if you will, you're going after that kind of permanent forever game. Stakes are high there because those are really valuable games you're going up against, right? If you're making a single player game and a single player experience, it can be easier because you're only really asking maybe for a few hours of time, eight to 10 hours, versus please make this part of your daily habit from now on. Of course, no, I, I, love, I love that <laughs> distinction. Um, you know, I think it's also really interesting, like, you know, obviously, we know the Wilders, you know, they have, they have a great vision for, for what they're building. Um, what, I'd love to hear just, like, anecdotally, what has it been like to work to bring that vision to life? Like, have there been any, like, interesting stories, interesting anecdotes along the way of, like, like moments of, like, breakthrough or, like, like creative, creative differences, or, you know, like, things, like, like how, how it kind of, you know, because th there, there's always a back and forth, right, in any partnership. Yes. There's always, like, in a working relationship, there's, like, there's the good kind attention the good kind of like breakthroughs the also like the challenges like what has it been like to kind of like build this together you know? yeah so first of first of all we're a remote team which makes it really hard so um we have people in north america europe asia oceana like really people everywhere which has its own uniquenesses with different cultures in terms of game in terms of development one of the fun things is we have some really incredible artists and uh they can make just insane buildings, insane characters. They can make insane coffee shops if you've seen the game. Um, and really like things that are quite beautiful and quite remarkable. And things that absolutely cannot run in real time in a racing game. <laughs> and so as we're building this and trying to make this incredible world, uh, it, we had this push and pull between making it really beautiful and then really sticking to our core about making something fun in gameplay, which is the gameplay first mindset of it's all about fun for the player and saying it needs to be running at 60 frames a second, it needs to be fast and fun and beautiful. And so by saying we're gonna prioritize the gameplay experience, we couldn't make it as beautiful as we wanted. And then in terms of the tension, it's the kind of the pull between, you know, optimizing and making sure it's really fast and then making sure we've got all the, all, all the art that we want. And the funny thing is, is at the end, um, Arm, who's a, a lead of our gameplay, gameplay team, is like, put in whatever you want, I'll fix it in the end. <laughs> and so all of this stuff, instead of optimizing, going back and forth, he's like, make it as beautiful as you want, I'll just take it out in the end if I, it doesn't work. So we did all of this work, and then in the end, we just kind of started to see, the, it got more, it just, the city started coming alive, it looked really, really beautiful. And then over the past three weeks, it's just, you see the frame rate go up a little bit, and up a little bit, when it's like, okay, just do whatever you want, and I'll clean up after you. So. Um, just little things like that. It's a young team getting together. It's a young team learning from each other. And what's really funny, this is the first time we've actually ever kind of all 
been together as a big group. So I love that. I so, love yeah. that. No, you know, we know we know what that's like with remote yeah. work uh, as well. And you know, one thing I thought was really special is uh, the Gateway. Gateway Miami yes. is in Miami. You guys that were was, in the game. I was driving by and like I almost crashed because of it. You know. <laughs> so thank you, thank you for including that and speaking about making things beautiful. You know, we got get, get some of those flowers. You know, I love it. No, but this has been a great conversation. It's been great to learn more about this. Everybody. Yeah. Give Thank it you up. so much. Give it up for Dennis. <laughs> Wilder World. Let's go Wilders. <laughs>